All righty. About one minute, and then we'll start. Uh, slides should be coming out to you pretty soon here. Uh, if any of you participated in the commercial training we did with Ameritidal on roughly these things, it's uh, almost the exact same slideshow, actually. Uh, I, I took almost all my exact same slides and added them into this one. So, so you'll see uh, a lot of repeats if you went to Ameritidal's commercial training. If you weren't at that one, it's all going to be new. So uh, hang on to your hats. It's going to be exciting and different. Start at 10 o'clock on the dot. All right, there we are, 10 o'clock. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. We appreciate that, you'll take, that you're taking the time to, to do these trainings and to learn about the various elements of the forms and the usage of them. Uh, my name is Nicholas Peasley. I'm one of the staff attorneys at Oregon Realtors. I had a hand in drafting most of the forms. Uh, it wasn't just me. We also had task forces and groups that got involved in our commercial forms. We actually had quite a few commercial brokers that got involved in the process. And so our forms are largely guided, in the commercial ones in particular, they're guided based on input from uh, a wide array of commercial brokers that we, we talked to. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the commercial transaction forms. Specifically, we'll be talking about Form 1.2, which is the commercial PSA, Form 6.1, which is the commercial assignment of lease, and Form 6.2, the commercial due diligence document checklist. If you're doing a commercial transaction, you're also probably going to hit upon uh, Form 2.4, which is the bill of sale. We're not going to cover that today. We've got other trainings that we can do on that one, or we've talked about it in the past. Uh, if you were at the Ameritidal thing, I also talked about that one in that training. So, so just stay tuned. We'll talk about bill of sale at some point on one of these Fridays. Uh, and also the leased or financed equipment addendum. That document is for uh, the transfer of equipment that has uh, security interest upon it. It's a separate concept that, uh, that we deal with in kind of a separate way. Uh, in those instances, there's a, there's a fully different process that we'll talk about for that. So be aware if you're in commercial, those are kind of the, the five horsemen of the uh, commercial transaction. And, uh, and we're only going to talk about the first three tonight, today, this morning, whenever it is. Uh, so to start with commercial forms, when we use the word commercial in the commercial purchase and sale agreement, that word commercial is never defined. It's uh, intentionally left quite vague. Uh, the intention behind that is to allow a more flexible and wider usage of the forms. There's a reason for that, and it's that commercial kind of writ large is sort of an undefined term in Oregon. Uh, ORS 105.850 gets as close as you're going to get to defining commercial, which is uh, the definition it provides for commercial property, and that is land and improvements used in a business operated thereon for the production of income, One or uh, and, and then it further defines it as one of the principal aspects of which is storing motor vehicles uh, or providing lodging for travelers using private conveyances. So uh, that ORS 105.850, while it does provide a definition of commercial property, that definition is largely focused on like motor hotels and uh, <laughs> And play the parking garages so so not super uh, applicable but it's as close as we get in the oregon statutes and the reason for that is commercial is a really wide concept uh as for when you would use the commercial form it's still kind of vague so for example is it a duplex are you just selling a quadruplex is that commercial that's probably not. That's probably closer to residential because you have one to four dwelling units. And so that's more likely to be a residential transaction. But if you have somebody that's doing some some super commercial like business uh, management of those that quadruplex, it could lean in the direction of using your commercial purchase and sale agreement. So you could use the commercial PSA on one of those commercial residential uh, operations. If, for example, you had like an apartment complex, uh, six to eight, 10, 20, some odd number of, of dwellings in one structure, yeah, that's probably commercial. That, you would use the commercial transaction forms for that. The, uh, the residential forms are not, they don't contemplate that many structures in one building. It only goes up to really four structures for residential. Everything beyond that, go commercial. If it's a warehouse or a mini storage unit, uh, it, that is absolutely commercial. That would, that's commercial 100% of the way. You would, you would definitely use that for commercial. Is a farm commercial? Technically, yes. However, we have forms for farms as well that are more applicable to farms, and that's because of the rights to emblems and the various protections that come with farmers. So we wouldn't use the farm uh, commercial form for the farm because there's other stuff you want to worry about. The, the reason why these forms are kind of as, as odd as they are, and the reason why I'm, I'm immediately beginning the presentation about our commercial form by telling you it's really hard to tell when you use it, is uh, commercial is a really squishy concept. If you have a building, for example, with a coffee shop in the floor uh, level and then an apartment, uh, three apartments in the, the second floor, 
is that commercial? Yeah. Is it residential? Also kind of yeah. And so you, it's, it's a use your best judgment situation on those tr uh, transactions. Generally, uh, the way that we drafted these forms, the way that it was intentionally created in the Oregon Realtors Library, is that our commercial documents are used for what we're describing as resumercial brokers, the people who are somewhere in between a hard commercial broker and somewhere in between a solely residential broker. If you are someone that does only commercial transactions, you have probably got your own custom set of documents or a lawyer that you call up to help you with the specific oddities of that transaction. Those situations where it's like a merger where a son inherits a part of the property as well as a transfer of equipment and assets and there's something crazy going on where they've got a dog boarding house or something like those situations that you have uh, the private practice attorneys run into all the time. That's when you're going to have your own special documents and custom stuff for that. These forms aren't designed for those hyper custom commercials. Uh, if you only do residential transactions, the commercial forms are sometimes very different looking than the residential forms. And so what we've tried to do is split the difference. It's a form that if you do residential a lot, you'll recognize the shape, structure, and format of it. You'll recognize the way to make the contract work, but it's more flexible to accommodate the more sophisticated uh, parties that are usually involved in these commercial transactions and to accommodate kind of the, the wider range of flexibility that's going to come with a commercial uh, sale. So the Oregon Forms Commercial PSA, it's designed to fit that middle zone, that, that somewhere in between really commercial and really residential, what we were describing and uh, we're, we're christening the term a resumercial broker. Uh, it's similar enough that you're going to feel comfortable, but it's different enough that you can still do a commercial transaction. Uh, if you are doing one of those super crazy transactions that's doing all kinds of moving parts, we'll talk about kind of elements of why this form is not perfect for those transactions, but you know, we'll get there. We're going to start with Form 1.2. This is the Commercial Purchase and Sale Agreement. If you are uh, following along at home or if you want to follow along at home, uh, you can pull up Form 1.2 on the Oregon Forms website. I'll put it in the chat so people have... I actually cannot... Uh, Katie, do you have a way of being able to send a text out to everyone in the chat? I can only talk to our panelists. Uh, but uh, orforms.org is the website, and in the top right-hand tab, there is a thing that says forms, and you can preview the forms on that section of the website. So orforms.org, forms tab, preview forms, form 1.2, then you can pull up a PDF of our form uh, and then follow along as we go through it. Or Katie should have sent out the, the PDF at some point, or we'll have it sent out to you guys at some point, and you can follow along with the exact slideshow that I'm doing here. So form 1.2, that's where we're starting. Thank you. Commercial purchase and sale agreement. So we're going to start, and I'm going to bounce about the provisions in this. It's largely going to be pointing out the provisions that are unique or special or kind of uh, distinct to the commercial purchase and sale agreement. They're different from the residential purchase and sale agreement. To begin with, like all the other purchase and sale agreements, your client should be relying on lawyers and accountants for all of the legal advice they want and all of the or financial advice they want. Your job is largely as a scrivener who knows things. It's not to provide someone with a risk analysis of what the transaction would be. If the client comes up to you and says, hey, in this per commercial transaction, the seller is asking that I don't do a phase, you know, extend my, my diligence period to accommodate phase two of my environmental assessments. Should I do that? Send them to an attorney or someone that, that does those environmental assessments because they want specialized knowledge about how long it would take or what the risk is of, of giving up that right. Your job uh, in this contract is to basically help the client get by giving them information and giving them links to things and giving them access to people that know things. It's not to say, oh yeah, there's no risk involved in that. Don't worry about it because you're going to get in trouble with your ENO if you start saying those sort of things. We open the contract, the first line of Form uh, 1.2 when you actually get into the purchase and sale agreement is this thing here. Uh, this is a legally binding contract. The parties to this agreement should read it in its entirety. If your clients have been reading some of the contracts, but not all of them, start having your client read all the contract. It's just good risk management. Uh, if the parties have questions about their obligations, seek out a lawyer or an accountant to explain those obligations. Uh, the legal description of the property is something that should be attached. So separate from the purchase and sale agreements where it says, you know, hey, put in the property address and, and let us know where the property is located. Where's the county? Uh, it's usually a mailing address, sometimes a tax lot ID. And it says, well, if not sufficient, put in more information. And then later on, we say you'll also have a, a, a legal description in a commercial transaction. The legal description is going to be attached as Exhibit B always. It needs to be in there. You need to have your commercial transaction legal description somewhere in that uh, that that document, that uh, that commercial purchase and sale agreement. 
Uh, in general, when you provide the original uh, address to the property, this is just something to give the parties an idea of what you're dealing with. 123 Main Street, if they know what's on 123 Main Street, great, then you know what you're dealing with. Uh, in some cases, you might have a transaction where it's like a warehouse or something that's down a lane where all of the buildings on that lane are the same, have the same mailing address. They're all, you know, one, three industrial boulevard or something like that. That issue, when you have all of them being the same mailing address, start using tax lot IDs to describe the property. If you have a situation where the tax lot ID is not descriptive, then you would technically provide the legal description. But this is to let people know what property you're dealing with. Uh, and then the other element of this is the personal property. So all of seller's rights and personal property uh, should be that, that transfers with the sale. It's going to be included on a bill of sale. So you'll attach a bill of sale to this uh, as uh, the way of transferring personal property. In many commercial transactions, you should have a significant number of pieces of personal property to transfer with it, with it unless you're just moving the actual building. In some cases, like a coffee shop, you're going to be selling the grinders and the cups and the napkins and all those other things, the inventory, the equipment and all that. That gets accomplished with the bill of sale. Section four of the commercial purchase and sale agreement is where we have all our financial terms. So uh, we have 4A, which has the purchase price. You'll put in a number, a million dollars. Uh, earnest money in the form of a check, a wire transfer, or a promissory note. You can do earnest money in the form of a promissory note, although check with your title companies. Many uh, will allow this, some might not. I know Ameritidal allows this. I don't know, I can't speak for certainty that with other title companies, but you can use a promissory note as a form of earnest money. They're generally very short-term promissory notes, like a 10-day promissory note, where the person is just kind of paying it out in short bursts, but they didn't have enough financing available at the moment they signed this agreement. So, so earnest money in a check, in a wire transfer, or in a promissory note if your uh, escrow people allow it. Uh, remainder of down payment, you'll write something down for the amount that is $100,000 is the remainder of the down payment. And then the remainder of the purchase price will be paid in either a loan, uh, in cash in a loan, or it'll be a seller financed situation. If it is seller financing, we'll touch on that a little later. Um, there are other forms to address that, and we would just advise in general that you do as little seller financing as possible. It's a risky place for brokers to be involved, and we would generally prefer from the risk management side that you do less seller financing and more conventional loaning or more all cash purchase. You know, It's way less risky for the broker when someone walks in with a briefcase full of money than when someone has a seller lending the money that they need to get paid back, and then you end up being a scrivener and a potentially uh, 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 tenuous uh, loan transaction. In section 4F, we talk about contingent and non-liquid funds. These are funds that are not guaranteed yet. They need to be specified at the onset. A contingent fund is a, uh, fund is a fund that does not exist yet. It will exist based on some future uncertainty. For example, a gift or a Christmas bonus, something like that. You can't guarantee it's going to show up. If you've ever watched Christmas Vacation, that's the premise of Christmas Vacation. Clark Griswold cannot afford the pool because his Christmas bonus was uncertain. That's why we specify this contingent funds, because sometimes it doesn't exist. And if a buyer goes in and says, oh, don't worry about it. My boss always gives me $100,000. Uh, question in chat, does Oregon Realtors offer seller finance forms similar to OREF? Yes. Our seller finance forms, we have a training, I believe, that we've done at some point where we touch upon them. Uh, if not, it's one of those ones that's coming up in the next week or so. Uh, or a couple of weeks. The, the seller finance documents we have from Oregon Realtors are more cabined in than the ones from OREF, but they accomplish the same tasks. Uh, and what I mean by that is, for example, in the place for interest, it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight percent interest. Those are your options. We don't go anywhere else beyond that because when people are putting zero percent interest in, that's a violation of federal tax law. You've given someone a gift, and if you don't have a, a gift tax return, you might get audited by the IRS because you did it wrong. If you put 10 percent, 12 percent interest in on your loan, you're violating Oregon usury law, and that's a problem. So we took our seller carry documents and shrank them in for what they're able to do to ensure that you're well within the range of being legally sound, uh, but it makes them less useful. So be aware, seller financing documents exist. Oregon Realtors has them. Uh, we generally have just made them as legally sound as we can, which means they are less flexible than you might be used to. It's not as much of a cowboy contract. It's more of a choose your own adventure pre-drafted contract. Uh, if you look on Oregon, orforms.org on the forms tab, it's the eight documents. All of our documents have a numbering system, one, two, three, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 3.1, that kind of thing. Eight point something, eight is the seller carry documents, eight one is the addendum, eight two is the promissory note, eight three is the uh, deed of trust, eight four is a land sale contract, and eight five is the memorandum of land sale. So if you go through that library, the eights are where the seller carry documents are. 
Uh, the idea for, uh, where was I? Not contingent funds, non-liquid funds are funds that you have to actually like liquidate before you can use. This is uh, the Bitcoins, the stock portfolios, that sort of thing. Uh, if your client, the buyer says, I'm gonna buy this, this warehouse, don't worry, I have a Bitcoin wallet, I'm good for it. That Bitcoin wallet might not exist next week. Uh, it, it's super sketchy money that may or may not exist at any given time at the value that's stated. So uh, specify at the start point if you're using something non-liquid that needs to be sold, a stock portfolio, that kind of thing. Uh, the, the seller has a right to know and the seller, if they do so, choose to enter a contract that's predicated on Bitcoin, they just are aware that it's a little risky. So specify those things. Uh, we have a space in here for earnest money deposit and when earnest money becomes non-refundable. The earnest money deadline is established here. It's X number of days, G3, maybe uh, however many you choose. It could be 10, it could be 30. It's whatever you want for your, your requirement for when you deliver the earnest money. And then release of earnest money or when the earnest money becomes refundable uh, or non-refundable and it's just straight up something that belongs to the seller, you can check a box to specify when that is. Is it upon the final day of the earnest money deposit deadline in section G? That's reasonable. Is it upon satisfaction or release of various contingencies? We'll get into those. Uh, that could be another option. Is it, you know, Thursday, May 6th is when earnest money is non-refundable. You have options. So non-refundability of earnest money is a typical thing in these commercial transactions and it's built into the contract in this section four. There is further definition of how we deal with earnest money provisions, uh, earnest money deposit. This is section 32 of the purchase and sale agreement, 1.2, section 32. Uh, this clause provides a two-prong attack. If you've done our other previous uh, trainings on Oregon Realtors forms, this is similar to the other ones. Uh, it's the exact same as the other ones, in fact. If earnest money is not deposited, the buyer has gotten to the day they were supposed to deposit earnest money and they didn't. The buyer had promised they were gonna deliver earnest money in six business days, whatever it ends up being. Buyer didn't deposit earnest money on that sixth business day. Seller now gets two options. They can either send in a notice of default and say, seller or buyer, you promised you were gonna bring the money in by Friday. Friday has arrived, there's no money. Uh, I'm gonna give you extra time, three more days, five more days, however much time you wanna give the buyer, or that, that buyer, bring the earnest money. If you fail after this cure period, I'm coming after you and I have the right to, uh, to terminate the contract and also potentially recover the intended earnest money sum, the amount the buyer was supposed to bring. That default invokes this ability to go after that intended sum. So if you go to a small claims court or you go to arbitration, you can say, I gave them the full time they were supposed to get for their earnest money, I gave them extra time, and they still didn't do it so I believe I've lost out on enough that I'm entitled to the earnest money and, and it gives a stronger claim to the earnest money in these disputes. The other option the seller has to, for themselves is they can just terminate at the end of that earnest money deposit deadline in section 4G. Three days have passed, buyer didn't bring the earnest money, seller can just cut the cord, just move on, cut bait and, and, uh, and move the ship to, to uh, uh, bluer waters. That is an option available to the seller. Fast market, Terminate now, move on to your next backup. That's great. Slow market, give them a notice of default, wait some more time. Potentially, uh, the buyer will fix it. They'll put in the earnest money. Great, you move on with the transaction. Potentially, the buyer doesn't do so, and now you have a right to the potential earnest money. If the seller terminates within that, that first two days after the deadline hits, uh, the seller does not have a cause of action to recover the intended earnest money sum. So buyer fails to deliver the earnest money. You say, fine, you end the contract and move out. Seller doesn't get to say, I, and I also want the $20,000. They don't get that right. The seller has to give, uh, do a good faith op option of, of cure before they have a right to recover that undeposited earnest money. So that's, that's how we're dealing with earnest money in this contract. In the uh, sections on conveyance, there are ways to convey a trans the, the property. Typically, this is going to be done by way of deed. Statutory warranty deed is usually what you're going to see. Uh, if you do it seller carried, you can do that. It's more risky, but uh, but it's also the process. There is a deed promissory note and deed of trust is one option, or a land sale contract is the other option. Uh, the, the reason why we talk about seller carry transactions being risky is because of this process. Uh, essentially, if you have a land sale contract, it's for those of you that, that have never done those, it's a rent to buy process. It's, it's roughly, that's the simplest description of it. I borrow money from you. I am a buyer. I borrow money from the seller. When I pay off all of the money that I've borrowed, uh, I now own the, the property and the seller will, will record a deed. But until I've paid off that money, I don't own the property. I have an equitable interest in it where I can use it. I can possess it, but I don't own it. The seller technically still owns deed title to the land under a land sale contract. In a promissory 
or no deed of trust. The seller deeds the property over to the buyer. The buyer owns the land. That's great. But then the buyer subsequently signs a deed of trust, which conveys the property to a neutral third party that basically just holds a sale right and then says, you know, buyer, if you ever fail on that promissory note, so help me, I will foreclose on this property if the seller asks me to. And so uh, a deed of trust is a way of kind of parceling the interest out to a third party who is a trusted neutral body that's going to ensure enforcement of the promissory note. A land sale contract is a rent to buy scheme, uh, but we would always just prefer you to a normal deed and a mortgage because then the bank takes care of all of the super complicated foreclosure procedures and timelines. Uh, keep in mind this section 27, this is the, the lower half here, uh, you are not an attorney, and your E&O insurance, e insurance will oftentimes not cover anything outside of professional real estate activities, so we very intentionally and expressly in this contract state, this is not selling the business, this is selling the real property, and potentially some of the personal property and the equipment and stuff that comes with that property, but we're not selling business names, we're not selling stock, we're not selling membership interest. Uh, we're not selling or assigning intellectual property. If you're gonna be moving any of those intangible assets, have a lawyer do that assignment of the intangible stuff because your uh, license does not necessarily cover that and ENO will gleefully reject your claims if something goes wrong. So, so be aware, you don't wanna be involved in a transfer of an intangible asset that goes haywire because you might be paying for it personally. This contract very expressly and intentionally states you aren't selling stock, you're not selling membership interest, you're not involved in that because we don't wanna to have to deal with the like sale of securities and things like that that you would have to put into other transactions. So, so just know, this is for the sale of property. It's not for the sale of intangible or intellectual property. It's the real property and personal property that's attached to it. Physical stuff is what's getting transferred. There are built-in contingencies in this contract. So we build in a handful of these sales contingencies and set, uh, set up ways that the contract is, is uh, will work or not work. Uh, for example, the contingencies buyer's agreement is contingent upon the release of the due diligence contingency or the release of the financing contingency. Uh, if the parties have made the contract subject to various things, it will then potentially terminate the contract if buyer does not release. Uh, this is worth noting. This is very different from the purchase and sale agreements in that the rest of the purchase and sale agreements do not automatically terminate. The commercial transaction does automatically terminate. In most of the other transactions, if the buyer is upset, they will uh, they'll opt into the termination. What we found when we talked to our commercial brokers is they tend to be very intentional when they want to terminate. If you're in a tr commercial transaction and you're exchanging some kind of a, a complex business process, uh, real estate transaction that's going on, uh, those parties will know when they want to terminate or not terminate. And so having this forcible opt-in provision was seen as moot and it, it, it created a, a rigidity that was not required in these kind of resumercial or closer to commercial transactions. So in the commercial context, it will automatically end itself. If the buyer does not release, if they're not satisfied with the due diligence and release it, if the buyer is not satisfied with the financing contingency and releases it, the contract will automatically end itself. So the buyer, it essentially it puts the, the ball in the buyer's court. The buyer is the one that gets to choose whether the contract continues or does not continue based on their satisfaction with the rights that they have uh, are given to themselves by signing the contract. Uh, so for example, uh, if the parties have made the agreement contingent on the finance contingency, if buyer has not affirmatively released it, you would use form 2.14, the release of contingencies and say, I release the financing contingency. If you do so, bully, move on with your transaction. If you don't release it, no. The contract will automatically terminate if that is not uh, if that is not released by the buyer. So be aware it flips the normal process of the residential PSA on its head a little bit. The buyer can also, uh, under this contract, the buyer is also given an additional right to conduct environmental assessments. These tend to be a pretty normal thing in these commercial transactions when you're buying, for example, uh, uh, former gas station or a current gas station, uh, you're going to do an environmental review. Phase one reviews are where we look at the historical uses and the current use. Is it a gas station? Yes. Okay. That's potentially a problem because there's a lot of times where a gas station has leakage and there's some sort of a contaminant in the soil that comes from a leakage of the actual underground tanks. If that phase one uh, ESA looks at it and says, whoa, there's been a sketchy usage of this property in the past, they'll generally require a phase two analysis. Uh, and this section of the contract basically says, if you check the box, you're agreeing that if you do need a phase two analysis, you're going to take some extra time. Phase two analyses can take a long time to do because you need uh, coordination of, of engineers and scientists and geologists and people like that that actually do the, the literal soil samples. And so what we have in this section, this provision is 
if you agree to it at the onset, the seller's saying, I am totally okay with the idea that if at a later date, uh, we find out we need to do a phase two analysis, we're going to kick the due diligence contingency and extend it another 45 or some odd days to accommodate this negotiation and this, this process of getting a phase two analysis established because you, this is a, a seller being reasonable and saying whatever, if there turns out to be a need for an environmental analysis, a big one, let's just keep the due diligence extended. We don't need to do an extra addendum or something like that to extend it. We're just going to, we're going to do it on the, at the onset. Uh, these phase two analyses, heads up if you're doing these commercial transactions in the state of Oregon, uh, sometimes it, you'll find there's contamination in the grounds, uh, and that's because it's, it's what we call a brownfield site at times. Uh, these are like lightly contaminated uh, environmental sites. They're not super fun cleanup sites where you have to call in the EPA and, you know, have a a, a secretary of the interior give a sad speech in front of the building or something like that. This is where you're going to have a, a, like a, a leakage from a gas tank under a gas station. There are funds available, revitalization funds available that you might want to let your clients know about. Brownfield Revitalization, ORS 285A188. This is where there's potentially money that your buyers can get access to to clean up these sites. So it's a tool that you should just know, have it in your back pocket when these environmental assessments are going on. Uh, so look into that. But if you need a phase two anal uh, environmental assessment and you've agreed to extending your closing day, your due diligence period out, use that section, give yourself extra time, uh, recognizing that these phase two analyses can sometimes take a long time to coordinate. The parties can, in section 12, uh, agree or not agree with the assignability of the contract. You can either say, whatever, it's assignable. Uh, the brownfield site contamination stuff, uh, that's that one's just a statute. So RS 285A188, uh, it starts talking about it in statute. It essentially just says there are, there are extra funds available statewide to cover these minor cleanups of sites. I believe it covers up to $500,000 for every million dollars of damage or something like that. There's a limitation to it. So if you have a bad cleanup, it it's a rebate but it's not a total payoff of the, the Brownfield site. Uh, and there's some other restrictions that they get more in depth than you'd want to talk to the actual people that have uh, the control of that Brownfield revitalization funds. I haven't done enough research into it to give you a really in-depth expl uh, explanation of it. Uh, I, I just know it exists and know it's a tool for you guys. Uh, so on section 12 of the purchase and sale agreement, you can set up assignment. If you just say it's permitted, it's permitted, it's allowed, great. If you say it's prohibited without seller's consent, also apply section 45, which says, heads up, there are some times where it's still, even if you say assignment is, is prohibited, there are still instances where the buyer can still assign the contract. Specifically, if the buyer is assigning the contract to an entity that buyer owns, so buyer personally signs the agreement because their LLC is getting set up in the meantime. Once the LLC is set up, buyer assigns the contract over to the LLC. Great, no problem. You don't need sellers of permission to do that because it's a buyer-controlled LLC that's being assigned. It's, it's roughly treated as the same as buyer, uh, but you're allowed to make that assignment. Uh, similarly, for a 1031 exchange accommodator, go for it. That's fine. Uh, if it's not allowed, if you say prohibited without seller's consent, all other assignments get seller's written consent first. There is also an extra section in our uh, section 13 and 14. We give you a lot of space to talk about additional provisions and to, to explain all the attachments, the addendums that are on the contract. Uh, this is for informational purposes. Give as much explanation and as much detail as you can. Uh, it's for this, this is to kind of in recognition of the flexibility of these commercial transactions was why we gave so much extra space on the additional provisions. Uh, you know, do, do what you need with the provisions at, that st at this part of the contract. It's worth noting time frames are established as uh, well as the start and end point of every day. Uh, you'll note that we say it's interpreted based on the time zone where the property is located. Why didn't we just say it's all on the Pacific time zone? Because out in Eastern Oregon, there are three or four counties that are actually on mountain time. So Oregon is a two, uh, two time zone state. Uh, so so that's that's where that if, if you're out in like Harding County, I believe you've got a little chunk of your county that is uh, is on mountain time. And so you know, we hear you. Uh, otherwise, business or calendar days are what you're going to see as the day timeline. If a business day period, if it says this, you have five business days to do X, on the end of the fifth business day, 5 p.m., that period ends. So business day periods end at 5 p.m. on the last day. Calendar day periods end at 11.59 on the last calendar day. At midnight, you're into the next calendar day, so, so that's why it's 11.59 rather than 12. Uh, so, so be aware. The contract does not provide the typical safety net. In the other contracts, all of the other purchase and sale agreements, we have this like, if you check both boxes, 
oops, or if you didn't check both either box, whoops, refer to the first box. And so if you left these blank, it would mean 20 calendar days. Congratulations, that's what we're going for. The problem is these commercial transactions are very, very flexible based on what's going on. If you're just selling a coffee shop, 20 calendar days might be a reasonable due diligence period. If you're selling like a multi-international business warehouse for a Google that wants to set up a server farm in Eastern Oregon or something like that, you're gonna need way more than 20 days for due diligence. And so having a default provision that says, oh, if you messed up, don't worry, we got you. We covered the little default section. It's right there. That's It's not exceptional in these contracts. Uh, make sure you are very clear on any time frame provision in the commercial purchase and sale agreement. Very intentionally choose the timelines. We are not going to default or, or, uh, or, or safety net the timelines because that safety net could create significant liability for the broker uh, in, in a way that, that just making a mistake and correcting the mistake would not create as much of li uh, liability. So uh, timeline safety net doesn't exist in the commercial purchase and sale agreement. Be very intentional about how you pick your timelines. If you're using a loan, we have this section here that talks about the financing section. Uh, the buyer, this section essentially says, if buyer is financing it with a loan, they will diligently and in good faith, take all steps necessary to get their loan. Get your loan as best you can. Uh, buyer must promptly inform the seller if anything changes, if there are any developments regarding their financing that could affect your ability to comply. So if the buyer learns from the lender, they're like, yeah, you actually need a job to get this loan. Uh, buyer should tell seller promptly. We define promptly in the contract as, as quickly as possible, but in no case more than two business days. Normally at law, promptly is just ASAP, which is super flexible and, and arguable. If someone takes a week because they were on vacation, well, it was reasonable because you had to go on vacation like that. Those arguments happen. Instead, we put a hard timeline, two days at maximum. When you see the word promptly, that means you have at most two days to respond to this thing. Uh, if the seller asks for it, buyer will promptly provide evidence of their efforts to comply with the terms of this paragraph. So if the seller says, are you are you really moving forward with your loan? You send them an evidence, whatever it is, a, a picture of an email from your lender that says, hey, I want to go on with the loan. And the lender goes, great, let's put the documents together. That's fine, but, but promptly comply. Let the seller know. Give them assurances. Uh, if the parties have made the agreement subject to that financing contingency, this is section nine that we were talking about earlier, uh, this is what applies. If buyer has not released the financing contingency, if they don't say, yep, I'm good, I am comfortable with financing has been secured, I feel comfortable, the contract will end at the end of that time frame. It will automatically terminate. So buyer has to have the financing set up it's not a seller termination right if the buyer's financing goes awry. It is a buyer satisfaction and release provision. The time frames on all of the generic areas are also doubled. Keep in mind that that safety net provision doesn't exist, but compared to like the residential PSA, if our the, the pre-drafted default language that we have is just doubling. So for example, instead of five days to review title, you have 10 business days on this one. Uh, this is not because 10 business days is how long people take in these commercial transactions, but because uh, we figured it was a nice kind of happy median. Uh, but if you're dealing with a title transfer of a small like one room shop or a, a single uh, building kind of thing, uh, 10 business days is plenty of time to review the title. If you're dealing with the transfer of property that has, for example, when I did private practice railroad lines moving through them, good luck spending 10 days looking into the, the, the review of, uh, of those. It might take 20 or 30 to look into all of the history of a railroad easement. Uh, is it accurate to say that buyer doesn't have to name the lender until removing the financing contingency? Uh, the that I, I it not test not necessarily there there is no necessary uh, space that specifically says buyer needs to tell seller who their lender is. Uh, that's not to say that the buyer shouldn't, uh, but it's the buyer doesn't have to. So I I'm giving you a very lawyerly answer on this, Greg. Technically, the buyer does not have to name the lender until they're removing the financing contingency, but a buyer acting in good faith probably should let the seller know at uh, an earlier stage. Uh, there is no simple uh, provision on the contract that literally says buyer to inform seller exactly who lender is though, so that's not part of it. All right. Uh, due diligence has been heavily modified. So if you've paid attention, if you've been in the uh, the residential purchase and sale agreement processes, we'll talk about due diligence. This has been changed quite a bit for the commercial transaction. Uh, I'll talk about it in chunks. First off, this is based on section nine. You can make the contract contingent upon the due diligence contingency being uh, accepted or approved. Uh, this section nine, you would check that box and say buyer is contingent upon buyer releasing due diligence uh, within 45 calendar days, 50 cal however many calendar days you need for your due diligence. You've got a timeline there. Uh, if the box in section nine is not checked, the buyer is still able to do their various inspections. It's just that the contract is not contingent upon it. 
That means buyer can do inspections, and if they find out it's actually a Superfund site, well, you know, buyer caveat emptor, you should, buyer beware, should have put it as a contingency. Generally, we expect to see this box checked in most cases, but sometimes it won't be the case. If a buyer just doesn't think it's necessary, they might not check that and make it contingent. In those cases, they can inspect, they can look into all kinds of stuff, but they don't have to. And if the buyer is satisfied with, or like even if the buyer is dissatisfied with what they find, uh, you can't terminate the contract based on that. Uh, where do you allow extensions to due diligence with additional earnest money down? So for those, you would put it in a general addendum, Form 2.2. Uh, you would just clip that into it and say, you know, we're going to do extensions of due diligence or there will be uh, extra money dig that goes down to uh, accommodate that extra due diligence time frame. But Form 2.2 attachment to it. Uh, over time, we expect we're going to have a more robust commercial uh, library, but at present, we just didn't get enough feedback from people in the commercial world as to what forms they wanted. So we only have uh, assignment of lease and due diligence list for everything else. You know, there's, there's the general addendum. One of the parts of this contract, and we do talk about the inspection contingency, so uh, parties need to work together with these inspections, so buyer will provide reasonable notice to seller, you know, don't just show up that day and give them a call and say, hey, I'm at your front door, I'm ready to do my inspection. Give them notice, reasonable amounts, uh, and they need to conduct the inspections at reasonable times. Don't show up at midnight, unless the seller's cool with that, in which case, fine, but uh, ask for seller's permission before showing up at unreasonable hours. Uh, for portions of the property that have tenants, if there are tenants involved, the buyer and seller are going to work together to make arrangements that are reasonable so that they don't disrupt the tenant. If you're going to be doing like a mold inspection or a radon test or something like that, you don't just kick the tenant out without asking them. So, so arrange these transactions, these inspections with the tenant, if possible, to avoid disrupting them. Seller will provide reasonable access to the buyer. Reasonable access means they'll unlock the gate. It doesn't mean they're going to pave the road for the buyer if it's a gravel road. It has to just be reasonable access. So, so reasonable access provision. Uh, and buyer is going to be responsible for restoring the property after any of the inspections happen. If there's damage to the property caused by the inspection, buyer is supposed to fix that. Buyer will indemnify, defend, and hold harmless the seller. For those of you that don't know what the indemnity provisions are, this is a pretty standard thing in law contracts. It essentially says if something goes wrong, you will protect me and pay for my expenses and my fines and my fees and the damages. Uh, example that we used in a previous training is uh, a residential example. Uh, a seller's agent and se seller selling a house, seller's agent's doing an open house, seller put a dog in the garage, just locked it in the garage to, during the open house. During the open house, the seller forgets to tell anybody about the dog, a buyer opens the garage door and gets mauled by the dog. Buyer sues seller and seller's agent, arguing seller, what the heck, you had a dog on the property, I got injured, also seller or a seller's agent, you should have told me. The seller generally has an indemnity provision with the seller's agent, which says, if yeah, if I ever cause problems for you, agent, I'll pay for it, which means in that lawsuit, that dog mauling lawsuit, the seller's agent can say, okay, seller, my attorney's fees you're paying for. Any damages I'm responsible for, you're paying for that as well. This is what indemnity does. It, it assigns the, the costs and risks of the lawsuit. And in this case, buyer indemnifies seller for any damages or injuries that happen during the inspection. So if buyer is doing an inspection and for whatever reason just starts swinging a monkey wrench around and clocks one of the tenants, that lawsuit against the seller, buyer pays for it. So if seller gets sued because of inaction or uh, bad actions of the buyer, the, the seller will have the buyer pay for it. Uh, if the seller asks for it, buyer is going to provide copies of the inspection reports and the in investigations and the, the diligence stuff. Uh, so if speller, seller asks for it, buyer provide it. Uh, <clears throat> The seller needs to also provide various diligence documents at the buyer's request. So this is where Form 6.2 comes in. We'll cover this one with a little more depth. Uh, within a set number of days, 20 calendar days, why not? Uh, as a due diligence period, seller needs to provide legible and complete doc copies, either in paper or electronically, of everything that buyer has asked for. We'll get to that due diligence document list. It's basically just a checklist of things. I want to see profit loss reports. I want to see surveys. I want to see architectural designs, that kind of thing. Uh, what the buyer requests, the seller will provide. Once the seller has provided uh, these documents, they are under an obligation to promptly notify buyer when things change. So if, for example, a tenant moves out during the transaction, the seller should tell the buyer if the buyer was asking about anything about tenants. If they wanted a tenant role and you're like, heads up, they're not here anymore, tell them within two days of learning about it if you're the seller. 
Uh, furthermore, if the buyer asks for it, the seller will provide access to the seller's architects, engineers, contractors, subcontractors, all those people that are connected to the property. So if the seller has an architect that worked with them on the property and the buyer says, hey, who is your architect? Seller should tell the buyer who their architect was. They shouldn't be like, you don't get to know. That's not how this works. You're trying to operate in good faith. And so there's an obligation that if buyer asks for that kind of contact information, seller will provide it. Uh, keep in mind, if the parties have made the agreement subject to the due diligence contingency, we deal with that if you have not released it, then contract is over clause. And this section does not modify well or septic system. So if you have well or septic rights, those are completely separate. They're their own thing. They're on their own track. Uh, th this is the way it's supposed to work. Buyers should always consider this due diligence document period when they're adding or putting in their time frame. So if you're giving yourself 30 days to collect all the due, uh, the seller, you're giving them 30 days to collect the due diligence documents and the buyer wants 10 days to review those things. Give yourself 40 calendar days as your due diligence contingency to accommodate 30 days to collect, 10 days to review. Give yourself more time in this diligence period release than you would than you would normally uh, like have in other contracts. It accommodates more time and more ability to receive documents and to respond and to negotiate and discuss. Please pay attention to the following as well. These are where things get a little wonky with these contracts for commercial in particular. Uh, smoke detectors and CO detectors. If the property has residential housing units, Oregon law technically requires smoke and CO detectors. This is not the case for all commercial. It's the case for some. If you have that coffee shop plus studio apartment building, you need smoke detectors and you're probably gonna need a CO detector as well. Uh, but if it's just a warehouse, Consult your local rules as well. The warehouses might need them under your county or your municipality, but uh, at, at a federal or a state level, there's no requirement that smoke detectors be in those warehouses necessarily. Uh, I imagine there are other building code restrictions that would apply there where it has to have an inbuilt system or alarm or something along those lines. But, but pay attention to your local rules. If you have residential housing, uh, you need these CO and smoke detectors. Lead hazards, uh, if you have a, a residential target housing, so uh, housing that was constructed prior to 78, that means, again, if you've got that coffee shop in the floor and studio apartment above, you might have lead hazard disclosures that need to happen. In Polk County and da the city of Dallas, there's a place called the Iron Jungle. It's a gym, uh, like a weightlifting gym, and above it, there's a studio apartment. Even though if you're buying that building, you're really buying the, the gym uh, the, the structure there has got all the inbuilt, you know, monkey bars and stuff. Uh, but because you have a residence above a studio apartment, you're going to be, and it's an old building, you're going to have all the lead form disclosures because it is target housing technically. Uh, lastly, the seller's property disclosure statement can apply sometimes, specifically if you have something that's improved with one to four dwelling units. Again, if there's a dwelling seller property disclosure statement, you've got to provide it. If it's not a dwelling, if it's just a warehouse or it's a mini storage thing, or it's a <laughs> a local dump or something like that. Uh, that's just a commercial usage, but there's no dwelling, so you don't need to worry about many of these other uh, additional and above disclosures. If there is a tenant within the space, the seller needs to provide an estoppel certificate if possible. Uh, the seller needs to make a good faith effort to get that estoppel certificate. Estoppel certificates, just so the, the people that haven't heard about that before know what they are, it's essentially a written document that says, seller, what's your understanding of the lease? What do you think we pay per month? What do you remember the terms being? It's largely there for those situations where you have an oral contract where somebody's just been living there and paying rent, but they never wrote it down. Because when the new buyer moves in, uh, nobody, the new buyer was not a part of the original lease. So they have no idea what the terms were. And if the, the tenant comes back later on and says, oh yeah, by the way, in the, the agreement that I had with the seller, they absolutely agreed that they were going to redo the roof every 10 years. If you're the buyer and you're like, well, I never heard about that. Uh, your option is either don't do it and maybe get sued or do it uh, out of fear of getting sued. And both of those are not exceptional options. An estoppel certificate is a way of saying, all right, tenant, put it on the table right now. How do you remember this lease working? Explain it to me right here and now. I will, And then we'll have that document in place if there is a, a later dispute. Uh, if the seller can't get an estoppel certificate, they're supposed to just provide a piece of writing that has their best remembrance of that lease. My understanding is it was $1,200 a month and I repaired the roof every 10 years, something like that. If you do have a tenant, we also use Form 6.1 for the assignment of that lease. Uh, we'll talk about those forms in particular towards the end of this presentation, 6.1 and 6.2. The last thing to deal with here is, and this one is where we make, made this change in an update, uh, coming update. It should happen relatively soon. At present, it just says seller will be bound by the agreement if they click accept and deliver a signed copy to buyer. Uh, and it, it, before, if it's received before the offer deadline, there is no offer deadline. Uh, so so the, the idea behind this is 
If you are a commercial buyer and you present an offer, your offer does not expire. It, it exists, it might languish, but it doesn't expire. If you want to withdraw it or revoke it, you can do that orally or in writing. You just say, the offer's off, I don't wanna do this anymore, but it doesn't expire automatically. The reason for this is when we talk to commercial brokers, a fair number of them say, yeah, these expiration dates on the offers are more of a suggestion than an actual thing. Most of the time, the parties are gonna keep wheeling and dealing for some, uh, some while and having some automatic kill switch on the contract is just irritating because we keep having to amend it and modify it. Uh, so what we've got instead is we're going to split the difference. Uh, seller is only bound by selecting accept and delivering a copy to buyer. That's the baseline. No expiration date. However, if the parties want to put an expiration date on the offer, you can do that in the additional provisions section. At that point, seller is only bound if they accept and deliver it before the expiration date. You'd accomplish this by saying buyer's offer automatically expires at date at time. That creates the offer deadline that you would then say if you, uh, you've you responded after that, it's a late offer and you're going to need to deal with the late acceptance processes. So baseline, no expiration on the offer. You can add it in the additional provisions if you want, but you don't have to. That's the purchase and sale agreement. Next up, commercial assignment of lease documents. So this is the, the assignment of lease. Uh, the start point of it is essentially it is uh, 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 the assignment. It's the way that you move the rights from one party to the other. The purpose of an assignment is that it moves the seller's rights and responsibilities as landlord over to the buyer. It says seller is taking the hat off as the landlord and putting it on the buyer. And the buyer is taking the hat and putting it on. Buyer then is bound by the provisions of the lease that they are assuming. And seller is no longer bound by the provisions of the lease they are assigning. Seller makes a clean break. Buyer is now in the hot seat. That's the point of assignment. It's what they're used for. Uh, the buyer becomes the landlord and the seller will instruct the tenant about this shift in the leadership. The uh, seller will pay pro rata amounts of rent and transfer security deposits if they exist. Um, by a pro rata rent, what we mean is, let's say you have a tenant who pays yearly, annually. It happens a lot in the, con uh, the agricultural context. Uh, the tenant, let's say tenant pays $10,000 a year to grass farm out on a random empty plot of land and you're using this commercial thing instead of an agricultural thing. Uh, the tenant, or the, the seller sells the property on the last day of June, buyer takes control on the first day of July. At that point, what we would do is we would say, uh, seller, technically you were only landlord for half the year, so pay a pro rata half that rent, $5,000, that goes to the buyer because buyer is going to be landlord for half the year. Uh, Lauren, will this webinar be accessible online? Yes. Uh, we post these up on the OR Forms website. We're also posting it up on YouTube as well. So you'll see on the Oregon Realtors YouTube channel, there will be a list of a host of trainings that are all of these concepts. This one will be up there as well. Uh, so, and the other thing to mention is security deposits. So back, back onto the form. Uh, security deposits. If you are selling property to a buyer, the security deposit gets transferred in its entirety. The seller doesn't get to keep a chunk of the security deposit as like a memento or something. They have to transfer the whole thing over. So if the, se the seller has a $3,000 security deposit, when the buyer takes over, buyer should be given a $3,000 check that is noted as the security deposit. It should stay a security deposit. Uh, it's what the buyer will use to pay for possible repairs repairs or damages or late rent if the tenant does something untoward. So it needs to be transferred in its totality. I've used this example before in some of the other presentations, but it's a great little silly example for people to, that, that are still kind of wrapping their heads around assignment. The idea is being a landlord is a specific hat that you put on. When you wear the landlord hat, you can collect rent, you can charge fees to tenants, but you also have to do all the things that a landlord has to do. You have to keep them in a place habitable. You have to repair the HVAC system if it breaks. When the old landlord, the seller, assigns their duties and rights and obligations in the lease over to the new person, the buyer, that moves the hat from one party to the other. That is the point of assignment. It is the movement of the hat from old to new. It doesn't change the hat. It just changes who's wearing it. That is how we do these processes. We're not creating a new lease. We're just moving the person who's in charge of the lease and who has responsibilities under the lease. That's how assignment and assumption is meant to work. Now, the commercial assignment of lease, we set up that the, buyer, the seller has a set number of days, 10 business days, if you need more, give yourself more, uh, after the mutual acceptance of the contract for seller to provide copies of the lease agreement and all attendant documents. Attendant documents would, for example, be amendments to the lease, uh, or for example, if you got a tenant in the property that is uh, that sent you a, a, a uh, ADA compliance request to have an emotional support animal. Uh, that document, that that 
ESA uh, proof document, the, the request, that should be transferred because the buyer needs to know. The buyer shouldn't get blindsided with a, a HUD lawsuit if they tell his tenant, yeah, you're not supposed to have dogs here. Uh, I read the lease, it says no dogs. If there was a previous document, like legal document that allowed an emotional support animal, uh, tell the buyer about this because that lawsuit hap it literally happens. Uh, there are examples of it on HUD's website. Uh, so give the buyer all of the attendant lease documents. The buyer needs to get them within whatever the time frame is you've given your seller to collect that stuff. Uh, make sure you take the personal identifying information other than a tenant's name or contact information off the document. Redaction means make it unreadable, illegible, not something that can be seen anymore. Uh, we are being overly protective with personal identifying information on in our forms just because it's starting to get a little bit more in vogue as a potential lawsuit. Theoretically, uh, there, there are very few claims that can be brought if an incoming landlord receives PII about a tenant that they will soon be in charge of. But for this purpose, we don't want to have, you know, for example, if a tenant put a social security number on something, black that out, the landlord does not get to see it at this juncture. And once they own the property, they might have access to that information. Uh, but at this point, they don't get that sort of information. In the review stage, when the buyer could still back out and then just take someone's social security number away with them, uh, redact that information. Seller, if the seller fails to provide these documents, the seller just doesn't. They're like, ah, I didn't want to give you the lease. It was too much work. Uh, at that point, seller is in breach, and the buyer can send a notice of default and opportunity to cure it. Say, seller, I'm going to give you another three days or so. Give me the lease documents. Uh, if the seller still fails, then you can terminate the contract, and buyer gets their earnest money back. Once the buyer receives all of the lease documents, once they've got all of them, buyer has 10 business days to review those lease documents. During this period, they can terminate because they don't like the lease documents. If the buyer looks at the lease and says, you've got a fixed term tenant for the next 10 years and they're paying $200 a month, this is, a, this is a, a, an absolute money pit. The buyer can walk away. They can, they can be done with it. They don't have to do this. Uh, and, and so th this right of termination exists for the buyer for a set number of days, your lease review period. Set up as many days as your buyer feels comfortable with. Uh, if they want to, to give themselves extra time to review a lease, if they really want to mull it over, give them more time than 10 business days. In general, 10 business days, two weeks, that's a pretty good amount of time. Once the buyer has all the documents, they get their, their review period. Uh, and if the buyer fails to deliver a notice of termination by the end of this lease review period, they have lost their right to terminate. They no longer can terminate based on their, ter their, their disapproval of the, the lease documents. Uh, essentially, what we're saying is uh, buyer, review the lease. You get 10 days. If you don't like it, get out. But you don't get to just keep this seller uh, in the wings waiting for your potential response. The buyer needs to give a, a very intentional I'm in or I'm out within that lease period lease review period. In the last thing to talk about in the commercial assignment of lease is the seller is making a handful of various promises. They make representations. The lease is in full force and effect. It's not somehow terminated. You don't have a weird like holdover tenant going on. Uh, the seller's interest in the lease is free and clear of liens. If, for example, the seller was in a nasty divorce and the seller's husband gets 10% of the uh, the, the rental income is some sort of a palimony. Uh, disclose that. Don't don't just let that thing suddenly show up as a lawsuit that the buyer show, uh, gets to learn about. That's something that you, you need to, dis to disclose. These representations can be walked around, but with a general addendum, you can say in a general addendum, whoa, heads up, disclosure, we're modifying this representation at 8B because seller has a divorce decree that forces them to pay a portion of the rental income out in the following way. Uh, seller also promises they have legal authority in to sell or assign their interest in the lease. Uh, if there is some sort of a restriction on seller's ability to assign the lease, they should tell the buyer about that. Uh, and the seller is promising there are no sums that are due under the lease. So if the seller has agreed to pay for repair costs or something, seller needs to disclose that. It shouldn't be something where the buyer just finds out afterwards that, oh, by the way, I, you're supposed to credit the, sell, the tenant for all repairs they ever do to the property. If the, the washing machine breaks, buyer, you got to buy them a new washing machine. That was in the lease. Disclose that information. The buyer can ask to end the lease. This is a provision that's in here under uh, the, the section 10. ORS 91 is usually what dictates uh, commercial leases, so non-residential leases. The buyer can always just ask to end the lease. They probably shouldn't because they may pay costs if they do so improperly. But if the buyer has like an actual, like literal commercial lease and it's got you know a 20-day termination uh, period on it or something like that, the buyer can say, seller, 
I want you to make a reasonable good faith effort to get that tenant out by closing. I want you to send them a notice of termination. If there are costs associated with this, if there's a lawsuit, if there are fees or things like that, I'll pay for it, but I want an empty building. Most commercial buyers who are gonna be buying these spaces don't wanna deal with that kind of extra expense. They, they don't care about it. But if you've got like a Microsoft or Google that's purchasing a building and wants to like move in and they just want it empty because they, they wanna move in and start their business, uh, they might, you know, the sky might be the limit and they might have a blank check for how much they're willing to pay to keep it empty. So at that point, this provision might be very relevant for them. In general, don't expect to see many buyers going, I want it empty because they pay for any possible costs or fees that are associated with the emptying of that property. Last thing we're going to talk about is the commercial diligence list. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward document. It essentially says seller is going to deliver all of the things that are requested by the buyer. Uh, seller should not should redact all PII, personal identifying information about tenants, uh, and they cannot if they cannot provide the documents. Seller will give an explanation, a statement explaining why they can't get the documents. If the buyer says, "I want six years of tax records," and the seller says, "I've only lived here for four years." Uh, you don't have six years of records. So the seller would send four years of records and a statement that says, only been here for four years, don't have the other two. That is generally sufficient. That's, that's a statement of explanation and, and reasonable buyers will look at that and go, great. I don't expect to get six years of tax records because you haven't been here for six years. Uh, until the transaction closes, the seller is also under an obligation to update information on any of this due diligence stuff that changes. This is similar to what we talked about in the due diligence section earlier. If information changes, seller is supposed to tell the buyer within two business days of the change. Once seller learns about the change, forward that on to the buyer. Redact information, then forward it along. Uh, the seller is also supposed to provide buyer with various updates of the various documents that are uh, they receive over time. So if there are changes or if there are updates or if there's new information that comes to light, seller, send it along. Just be a reasonable person. The buyer can select various documents. This is part of the due diligence checklist. This is just a chunk of it, but there's a basically just a bunch of check boxes and the buyer can pick what check boxes they want to get. Do they want property tax statements? Do they want leases? Do they want tenant ledgers? Do they want service contracts? They can ask for this stuff. If the buyer is asking for more things in their due diligence document section, they should give the seller more time to collect these documents. A buyer who checks literally every box just because it's there and only gives the seller like five days to collect them should just generally expect this contract to fall apart and it's kind of on the buyer at that point. So, so be aware, be reasonable with how many documents you're checking and how much time you want to give the seller to address these things. That's pretty much it for the commercial diligence document. There's a signature section at the bottom where the parties say, I agree that I'm going to provide the stuff like we promised. But otherwise, that's all there is to the diligence document list. And that is actually the end of the presentation as well at this point. Are there questions about stuff that we've covered at this point, or other questions writ large? I talk fast, I know, so if I if I blast it over something, let me know and I can cover it again. If no other questions, uh, this will be accessible online. You'll be able to see it on our website, orforms.org. We'll also have it up on uh, uh, on the various uh, uh, platforms that you can you can access the the stuff through YouTube, that kind of thing. And and I believe we'll have links on our website, the Oregon Realtors website. Uh, I see a question. Could I talk a little bit about what not to say in addendums since you aren't lawyers? Uh, that is a good question. Generally speaking, with addendums, if it is a provision that is a, a traditional or, tra or like classically used provision in a contract, I'm like oh, we're extending the expiration date, that's fine. If you're adding a right or removing a right from a party, that's something that generally needs to be pre-drafted by an attorney. Uh, this is the reason why in most cases when you start getting into like hyper flexible contracts and really, really commercial stuff, you usually got a, a lawyer on speed dial because if an attorney drafts the thing, you can use the attorney drafted form. That's not practice of law because the attorney is the one that wrote it. You adding something in that's been vetted by an attorney does not get it in violation of ORS 9160. So, so you can do use addendums that are pre-drafted. When you're custom drafting your own addendums and you're writing your own thing, if it's just expanding phrases or time frames, if it's modifying terms that already exist in the contract by like extending timelines, that's great. If it's something where you're literally like adding or removing a right, something where it's like also buyer has to flip a coin at the end of the process and it's tails, they have to pay all the money and don't get the property. That would be something that needs an attorney drafting it because you would technically be in like the, the, the danger gray zone of practice of law. Uh, where we run into problems is 
the bar association in Oregon hasn't really done a ton of uh, of education on what is or isn't practice of law. The last time there was a significant case on it was in I believe the late '60s with the uh, Securities Exchange Commission, uh, and that one was a relevant case that said you can't even pick forms for your clients because that's that's totally practice of law. But since then, the legislature rechanged, modified, they rejiggered what it was to practice law, and ORS 9160 was changed to allow a specific exemption for realtors who are doing real estate activity, professional real estate activity. And because your professional real estate activity license allows you to arrange sale and offer of real estate, it means if it's a usual kind of term that most brokers in the field, a reasonable broker would have written, it's fine. If it's outside that realm of reasonability, if you're doing something really custom, eh, get a lawyer to write that really custom thing. Does that help answer your question, Karen, or is that the, I, I, I recognize that I just walked around a gray zone several times and pointed it out without actually giving an answer. Uh, how many, how often, how many agents uh, transactions do you think this Oregon form is used? Uh, so for this one, the commercial one, we don't necessarily, we don't have the exact numbers on it yet. What we do know is we've got several thousand uh, forms in use right now across the state. I believe the number when we added up all of our sections together is somewhere in the ballpark of three or 4,000 active uh, like listings and transactions using Oregon Realtors forms. Uh, and, and that's, it's only been live since February 22nd. So that's a pretty, pretty good set. Uh, as for the commercial one, until we get to the end of the year and have actual like really robust information from the platforms, we won't know how often this form specifically has been used. We will get that data at some point, but the platforms, uh, we, we've agreed to get it, I think, quarterly or biannually on the, when we get like literal documentation on how often each individual thing is used. And so, so we don't know. It's possible that quite a few are alive, but we, I, I can't say that for certain. Any other questions? I can, I'll, I'll be here till, uh, till 11 o'clock and after if people have questions. Otherwise, thank you everyone for spending the time. Uh, CE should pass, pass out within the next two, three, three weeks, Kate, Katie, three, three weeks. Uh, some period of time CE will be sent out uh, and uh, a certificate, so you'll get that. Uh, two weeks for CE, there we go. Uh, otherwise, thank you everyone. The, the information will be posted up on the website. Uh, it'll be posted on YouTube and you'll be able to, re you can review the documents themselves on orforms.org. Uh, if you've got curiosities about other things, we do one of these trainings every week, Friday from 10 to 11 on a different topic. Stop the screen share for now so people don't have to just stare at things as questions. Right, seeing no other burning questions, I'm going to end the, the slideshow. Everyone have a good weekend. Thank you so much for the interest, and uh, I, I hope everything goes well for you guys in your transactions, and you know, stay dry if you're in a wet place right now. <laughs>